Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to our Open Democracies weekly live discussion, our last before Christmas. My name is Julian Richards. I'm the managing editor of Open Democracy. And this evening, we're going to be talking about fake news. However, if you're sick of hearing about fake news, we're taking it a step further because tonight we're exploring the idea that fake news is fake news. Um, we're going to be building on that part of part of the thesis of a Marcus Gilroy Ware's uh, new book, which is just published called After the Fact, The Truth About Fake News. Okay. AJ, I think you have a copy that you can demonstrate show people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my bit. <laughs> um, published by Repeater Books. Uh, his previous book was Filling the Void, um, Emotion, Capitalism and Social Media, also published by Repeater. So this is a uh, an area he's, he's definitely working in for a long time um, and on top of that he's uh, among many other things a senior lecturer in digital journalism at the School of Film and Journalism in the University of the West of England. We're also very lucky to have with us Eja Kamel Kuran who is a writer and a novelist. Um, last year she published a non-fiction book called How to Lose a Country, The Seven Steps from Democracy to Dictatorship, which is about the rise of right-wing populism, um, described by Margaret Atwood as essential. And uh, Philip Pullman said that she's one of the most astute and perceptive analysts of the furtive growth of fascism. Everyone should know about this. So uh, we're, in, you know, we're definitely going to have some very expert stuff to hear from this evening. The other uh, most important participant this evening is you. Um, we want this conversation to involve you as much as possible. Um, so first of all, a big thank you to those of you who've already submitted questions ahead of time. Uh, we're gonna try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom and you've got a question or comment for us, please click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and chat into the chat, type into the chat window there. Um, we'll try and pick up your question from there as we go. So to get going, I've got my first question is for Marcus. Um, I mean, your book, as you say very early on up front, is not really or just about what we commonly call fake news. It's much broader than that. You write not only about conspiracy theories and journalism, you also write about the trouble with liberals. Um, is there one phenomenon going here, going on here? And if so, what is it? Um, thank you, Julian. Well, first of all, I want to give my my thanks to uh, to Open Democracy and also especially to Ejit Malkilan for for joining me, joining us in in the, in this conversation. Um, it's a real honour. Um, I think as far as um, if there is a single phenomenon going on here, I'd say yes and no. I mean, I've tried to write about a number of different kind of overlapping phenomena, and central in there somewhere, I think, is the kind of presence of what. I try to narrow down as the market-driven society. So I suppose that is one phenomenon. Um, but I think, you know, that's that sort of an indirect, there's an indirect relationship to that some of the time, because what I really wanted to write about was the fact that the accounts we give about these kinds of informational pathologies and, and sort of, you know, some of them are related to technological systems that we use as well. The accounts we give are frequently misinformed. Um, you know, whether you're talking about conspiracist thinking or bad journalism or mendacious free markets and advertising or whatever, these are all different kind of obstacles to our understanding of the world. Um, and they're all kind of rooted in the ways that we've built that world. You know, I mean, narratives that journalists are either holding power to account or that they're fake news. That simplicity in itself is an obstacle to our understanding this properly. That conspiracy theories are just plain silly and crazy rather than having an origin in the structures of power. You know, that the values of the enlightenment and technological innovation are enough for us to build a new world, uh, or these kinds of things. Um, they're all sort of like uh, tangential and, and, and related parts of how we think about misinformation. And uh, yet all of them are kind of um, utterly misinformed uh, themselves. And so I think there's kind of that, you know, last time when I wrote about um, social media, there was a sense that there's a lot of kind of explanation of these pathologies that's, um, that's incorrect. But sort of when you're talking about another issue, you can sort of just try to make corrections. And then I realized that actually here, when there's mi misinformation in our understanding of misinformation, then that problem itself is something that we need to kind of 
to talk about. Um, and I suppose, you know, one of the questions for me was, well, why are so many of the stories we tell about misinformation wrong? And um, not only wrong, but also quite often disingenuous and shallow and, you know, half-truths and, so, uh, and so forth. And I think I found that that was um, because so many of these kind of informational obstacles or pathologies or whatever you want to call them are rooted in, in the world that we've built and the kinds of um, things we've come to accept and normalize about, about that world. When we all kind of deep down know we've, we're living in an utterly dysfunctional world. And yet there's a sort of, because we don't want to rock the boat because we can't necessarily easily imagine what, what could come after that world or instead of it, or what, what better worlds could be built. We sort of avoid those analyses and try to you know, blame technology or blame um, you know, only the most extreme parts of the political spectrum or something like that as a way of not really having to deal with uh, the full picture. So that's, I think the main, um, if there's one phenomenon, I think it's probably that. Thanks. Thanks, Marcus. I mean, H.O., you've written about the journey from democracy to dictatorship. I mean, of all those phenomena that Marcus has just talked about, which do you recognise as being particularly significant in that, in that trip? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Julian, for amazing introduction. And thank you, Marcus, for all the kind words. It's uh, the honour is mutual. Uh, and I have to hold your book a little bit you know, with me now, because obviously I am the only one who has the book at the moment. So I'm holding it so people can see. Um, this is a very important book and thank you for writing, Marcus. Uh, and I told you earlier before we started going on, uh, before we went online, it's like a, you know, very powerful steam train. It's, it's the rhythm of it. Uh, normally in nonfiction books, you don't find that rhythm that, you know, compels you to read, but this is a very uh, compelling read, I should say. So thank you for writing the book. Um, okay. Uh, before coming here, while I was reading the book, I didn't finish it yet, uh, but I am, um, you know, I, I read more than half of it already. Uh, I was thinking, what is Marcus uh, and I do differently than the rest of the books, many of the books uh, that have been written on this subject? Because as you know, Julian, as well, um, this has become an industry. Uh, almost uh, there is this intellectual industry of post-truth now, especially since 2016. And the industry became um, quite glamorous, I would say, uh, after Trump came to power. Uh, when American intellectuals, writers, commentators join in the conversation of post-truth and uh, current rise of uh, right-wing populism or fascism. Uh, what sets us aside, people like me and Marcus, I think we are trying to show people that we are uh, this current rise of fascism misinformation, disinformation, uh, manipulating the masses towards, uh, against their interests through disinformation and misinformation is not a technical uh, problem, is not an acute disease. Uh, it, 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 that is not a temporary deviation from the political scheme that we are living in, uh, but actually it is a, it is a you know, systemic problem. Uh, it is inherent in neoliberalism, as uh, very kind, as Marcus put very kindly, the world we built. Um, so, I think we are trying to both of us trying to show that this did not happen uh, in 2016 when Trump came to power or Boris Johnson came to power or Modi or Putin or wh whatever. Uh, and Marcus does, uh, you know, does all, uh, a similar thing, which I did in How to Lose a Country. He goes back to the, to the end of 1970s, beginning of 1980s, where uh, things started changing for people like us. And when I say us, I mean people who consider human dignity, equality, freedom uh, as the main pillars of our kind, uh, of the world that our kind should build. Um, so um, 
1980s is the beginning of you know the answer to the question of what went what went wrong how did we end up here um and of course what marcus talks about in the book about this information misinformation um and using information in the political war um against the you know benefit of our of our kind uh, is pretty much interlinked with the fascism that we are living, uh, we are witnessing today. Um, and as Marcus said, people, are, it's easy to blame social media, technological uh, developments or this and that, but actually I think uh, we were all in it to start with, but somehow our perception is um, again, shaped by uh, the current zeitgeist so much so that uh, we somehow forget that Thatcher and Reagan started this whole, um, you know, disease, political disease, if you will. Uh, but now, uh, after, you know, several decades, our perception is manipulated to think that Thatcher and Reagan were true leaders Blair and uh, Clinton were reasonable men. And somehow all of a sudden we ended up uh, clownish uh, leaders such as Boris Johnson and Trump. And it didn't happen like that. And Marx's book uh, tells a lot about how actually it happened, uh, in, especially in terms of communication sphere. One thing maybe we should clarify here, uh, we tend to think that today's communication sphere is a free agora. And Marcus talks about this in the book as well, this perception of uh, equal voices and so on. We, and we, we think that we are living in an agora where everybody has a voice, everybody is free to tell what they want to tell, whatever. It is not, actually we are, you know, doing all these politics, we are showing our political reactions, we are organizing, in someone's private garden. Uh, and these are companies, Twitter, Facebook, and so on and so forth, you know, all these big social media companies. And it is only consistent that these companies act, behave according to the rules, moral, political, and ideological rules of the system we are living in, which is capitalism. So as Orondotti, want, Orondotti Roy once put very, nicely truth is a commodity that goes to the highest bidder and i yeah. think marcus and i would agree on this or you know our books at least agree on this that this is the main problem that uh -huh. that truth the fact uh, is becoming the commodity as well and then I on of course you cannot really go far from fascism you know you cannot distance a yeah. from fascism Thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. And, and one of the things that you, you brought up was something which I thought was one of the kind of most interesting things that really resonated with me in Marcus's book, um, you know, which is what I call the trouble with liberals. Um, and Marcus, you, you know, you make the point very well that um, whilst there's obvious, you know, attractions to the idea of being reasonable, being not extreme, being kind of in the centre, you point out how the, chef, the centre indeed shifts um, I wonder if you could, you know, how do you feel that, you know, and you give examples, I mean, as we know, as you say, the, you know, the, the policies that would have been, you know, considered, you know, conservative Tory policies in, say, the 60s or 70s would now be, you know, quite difficult, would be considered quite radical <laughs> and left these days. Um, so, how, to what extent do you, do you attribute that shifting to kind of pressure from the, the rights that you describe, the, the kind of um, the neoliberals, the, the Hayek and his followers, um, and how much of that is due to kind of other, other forces going on, possibly the failure of the left to, to attract people to, to exert a countervailing pull to its own side. Okay, well, I think um, I'll start by saying that I've, I, 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 
um, one of the things I did in the book was try to be very careful about the language that I use. And actually, yes. liberals is primarily not the term that I use, precisely yeah. because, especially having lived in the US a long time, where liberals means like Hillary Clinton and everyone to the left of her, um, you know, and the, the bashing of liberals becomes a sort of right wing talking point. I didn't really want to sound like I was kind of joining in with that. I think one of the things I did want to point to is how incredibly ideological something which we call the center. Often mm -hmm. actually is and by calling it the center we sort of take it away from these extremes which we call left and right and somehow make it seem like it's it's very pragmatic and unideological when in fact you know i mean hayek for example didn't didn't consider himself right wing he was a classical liberal you know um and actually i think in a way we sort of have made a mistake in our uh, political analysis when we when we conflate neoliberalism with the right i actually think that neoliberalism and regular liberalism have a lot more in common with each other, perhaps differing uh, intentions to a degree, um, but actually a lot of similarities as far as the kinds of, you know, state visions of the state, for example, that they, that they espouse and so forth. So I think the problem that I was trying to kind of, you know, to, to highlight there is this, this sense that when you try to uh, represent yourself as the kind of unideological position um, and that you you just believe in these kinds of, of you know, it's, it's truth, science, facts, technology, um, some kind of thing called democracy, but actually really is more about, you know, shareholders voting or whatever. Um, you, 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 do, um, you do us a, a disservice because this is a kind of pretend progress um, in which nothing really is able to change. And in fact, there's a sort of slow drift away from, or potentially a slow drift away from any kind of substantive, transformative, democratic aspiration um, towards, you know, a sort of confected, veneered view of the world, which um, I, I think is actually what gives rise to then a, a kind of far right backlash. And I'm not trying to create some sort of moral equivalence there because um, I don't, I don't see it that way, but I sort of think that you have to see that kind of like, um, I mean, Escher puts it very well in her book, actually, that rather than the banality of evil, it's sort of the evil of banality, that actually this kind of system of pretending that it is just kind of, you know, pragmatic and sensible and nice and, but nothing else actually gives rise because of its hypocrisy, kind of feeds a sort of anger against the system. Meanwhile, neoliberalism which you know is is relatively similar in so far as it believes in certain kinds of positivistic constructs like the free market and so forth um neoliberalism is is something that has also spent a lot of time attacking democracy and the state and kind of running those things down um so again we see a sort of an agreement between these kinds of far-right uh, anti anti-democratic impulses and and the kind of mainstream sort of um you know, system-based, but rather empty kind of conception of, of the state. And I wanted to highlight the, the symbiosis there, really, because I don't think it's sensible to see them as two different systems. I think they are one, one and the same, even if the people within them kind of consider themselves to be looking in one direction or the other. Can I jump in here, maybe? Yes, please do. Um, you know, I think it was the first chapter, Fake Democracy, um, after the, yeah, take democracy, one of the uh, first chapters. Um, the, you know, the, the thing you just said uh, is a big problem, uh, which is like this, it is fake. We know that uh, the, you know, the democracy, the representative democracy with, in its current state has become the caricature of itself. And then uh, that is why actually, when Trump says, for instance, um, let's draw, uh, drain the swamp, we cannot say there is no swamp, you know, as an as, as as opposing voice, we cannot say that. Uh, or we cannot say that it's not hypocritical. We, we know that it is the entire system is, you know, standing upon some, you know, pillars of hypocrisy. So uh, I think, the you know the, the the dilemma of liberals in terms of uh, American way of you you know I'm using the way in the Americans use it in terms of liberals it creates a it creates such a dilemma um, and cul-de-sac actually because you have 
uh, you know, especially in the first uh, period uh, when right-wing populism shows up on the political stage, you don't have much to say because they are actually telling the truth. They are not telling the truth uh, to um, for the people uh, or with the people, whatever, but they, it is not a lie what they're telling. It is not incorrect, let's say. And I find it quite, quite puzzling for the intellectuals of those countries that are subjected to uh, far right backlash, as you call it. Uh -huh. They cannot come up with like, no, 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 it's not true because it is actually true. Yeah, I mean, I think... Ed, you... oh, sorry, go ahead, Marcus. No, I was just, that made me think of um, the way Adam Curtis highlighted that Trump in 2016 and around the time that he was first you know, running to be US president was using language. Sometimes it's far right language. And sometimes it was language that, as he put it, could have come from the Occupy movement because he was highlighting the inconsistencies and hypocrisies of a system that was, you know, that had all of those flaws and yet using that to push even worse disinformation and even more, you know, um, damaging policies in, in, in the kind of other direction. Um, but it's like one system that's flawed enables, um, you know, other kinds of pathologies to thrive. There is an elasticity to the narratives that we have been using, especially after the second half of 20th century, I think. I am old enough uh, to uh, have witnessed, uh, you know, first Porta Alegre, first World Social Forum, Porta Alegre. And then a few years later, I was uh, astonished, surprised, I was shocked actually to see that the exact same narrative was used by Hezbollah and Ahmadinejad uh, when so-called being anti-imperialist. So, you know, this narrative being used by either side uh, is uh, pretty problematic. Maybe we should be thinking about what narrative is and maybe politics should, but should not be, deep, you know, standing upon narratives as much as it does today. Maybe that is yeah. also something that we have to consider. <laughs> AJ, I wanted to talk to you about the, the, the role of the media. You used to be a kind of working journalist, I think, that's how you, and, um, you know, you, for those who don't know, um, you're published widely in Turkey, uh, places like Le Monde and The Guardian. Um, what's your approach to the questions of balance, to notions of objectivity, which you know, are obviously very questionable in, in, in journalism, neutrality, explaining both sides of an issue, um, we have our own debates about this at Open Democracy, about how you handle that. Um, but I wonder what your kind of uh, approach to that, to, to sort of balancing those, those competing uh, tensions. Mm. Uh, well, I started journalism in 1993 when I was eight, 19. Um, so, uh, and I remember how things shifted uh, morally, ideologically, uh, as well as professionally. Uh, and I remember how the uh, the word objectivity became, uh, uh, how shall I put it? Um, the only the only uh, uh, bearing, let's say, for journalism. Um, and it took me quite long to realize that actually what they're talking about is not objectivity but neutrality and in a, in a, in a society where you know the powerful has all the tools to exercise uh, its power to be neutral means automatically means that you are standing with the powerful simple as that um, like, <laughs> this is very simple so uh, when you're talking about let's say uh, those workers who are on strike because they are living in inhumane conditions you have to give the platform the same platform to the employer uh who is doing all the horrible stuff to them let's say is this objectivity well I, i'm not sure and people should not be sure about this either uh, because that kind of objectivity, for instance, in Britain, led to Nigel Farage being a person, <laughs> like a real, you know, respectable person, and now he's in European Parliament. Uh, and I can, you know, give several examples from Turkey as well, because we were so 
hygienic about understanding uh, of objectivity that we let uh, those let we have let those people uh, have respectable legitimate platforms in the society uh, and American media is now reacting to that and Twitter as well saying you know Trump is lying here <laughs> like this is a misinformation or something uh, yeah. but it is too late uh, I think uh, yeah. you know journalism has been reshaped already um, as in, in, in institutional in, on institutional level and also on individual moral level as well. Yeah, and, and Mark is talking about that as well. I yes, think. yeah, I know. Yeah, and <laughs> indeed, Marcus is very is kind enough to say kind things about open democracy, among other things in the book. Um, <laughs> but um, what's your take on that, Marcus? I mean, you know that 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 you know I know it's something that you write you write you write about quite a lot in the book. You know that how do journalists manage to without just being sort of, you know, preaching to the converted, without kind of, you know, without wanting to kind of amplify the mess of the voice of the powerful, which has enough amplification already, and yet wanting to kind of give a kind of proper sort of critical approach to the material they cover. What's, how, how, what line can we take on that? Well, it's difficult, as, as it just says, it hasn't, you can't just look at sort of journalism where it is now and where it needs to go without kind of understanding a certain story about what has happened to journalism, you know, and what journalism has been involved with in the last kind of, um, you know, a few decades. I mean, okay, the first thing to say is that we should dispense with the idea that journalism is, is one monolithic thing and that all journalists are equally guilty of the same, because there are some fantastic journalists out there. Um, I suppose I feel like, I mean, you know, I, I teach journalistic ethics as one of the things I have to teach. And so we spend a lot of time, you know, um, talking about this kind of idea of you know, speech and platforms and but also kind of you know who you, I guess who you give a voice to and what what is objectivity and you know what are the bounds of debate and so forth and um, so I guess without wanting to go too much into like <laughs> academic mode or whatever I guess we, we you know talk about this difference between you know a model of objectivity as neutrality as it has kind of outlined for us or or a model of objectivity as a kind of, um, as a practice, as an imperfect practice, as, as an, op uh, an attempt at least to try to represent the world in the best possible way. I had a student a couple of years ago who was doing a story on um, uh, sort of what they call it, monocrop agriculture, the kind of really aggressive forms of, you know, large scale agriculture in the US um, that, you know, are destroying ecosystems and things like that. And this student had spoken to lots of different, you know, people in 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 the discussion about, you know, the merits or drawbacks of this. Uh, mostly about the drawbacks, uh, because the people who know about the drawbacks are all quite willing to speak about them, um, because they don't really have anything invested in in debate other than raising the alarm. Meanwhile, trying to actually speak to the farmers who are doing these um, these practices um, was impossible because they wouldn't they wouldn't talk to this student at all. And so they came to me and they said, well. You know this doesn't feel very objective i've got lots from one side and not from the other and i was like well you've kind of done your work because you've you've spoken to you've done lots of research on the background kind of your scientific side of things you've spoken to lots of people there's an objectivity in your attempt at having tried your best to to reach a kind of picture of what the state of affairs actually is there's a i think an old aphorism in journalism that you know if one person says it's raining and another person says it's sunny you don't just represent both sides, you look out the window and, and kind of try to ascertain um, that for yourself. On the other hand, we know that, I mean, one of the other things I wrote about in the book is this idea of hyper-empiricism, that um, the over-reliance on what the data say, going outside of the bounds of certain you know, questions where maybe the data alone are not capable of telling us anything very interesting is also a problem. So there's a lot to be said about kind of, you know, how to approach difficult issues in an intelligent way, which I would expect to be something that is built into the kind of uh, assumptions of, um, you know, talking about journalism, but unfortunately it's something that still has to be pointed out. The other thing to say about journalism, I suppose, is that if you're, if you're um, considering the role that it plays in this broader, um, you know, information ecosystem, I feel that on the whole, mainstream journalism has failed to challenge um, our transition into a market-driven society. And in so doing, um, you know, 
but there was a time when raising the alarm about that would have made a real difference. Now it's too late to just point that out and expect it to make a huge difference. Um, and in, but in so doing, journalism has sort of become complicit in its own demise, because if you allow everything to transition into a market driven society, then what does journalism become within that market? It becomes, you know, cheap, sort of, you know, it, it runs the risk of being um, affect driven, curiosity driven kind of, you know, content in effect that doesn't necessarily have any direct uh, connection to that political state of affairs it becomes alienated uh, in itself and so right. just sort of yeah. come back to you on some of that because I mean you know certainly you're not the only person saying that um, you know journal mainstream journalism is certainly good at best complicit in the system that it's reporting on but I mean my answer to that is often well you know there is plenty of good information out there even in the flawed mainstream media I mean maybe cap private eye for instance doesn't count as mainstream, but you know, I always think every fortnight it publishes stories that really ought to bring down the government. Um, the Financial Times, the BBC, a lot of the BBC's coverage. Um, also, for those who want to read it, who, who actually want to pay attention, it's, it tells you maybe not everything you need to know, but quite a lot of it. Um, and indeed, you know, our own Open Democracy, our, our, our campaign about freedom of information has been supported by some very prominent right-wing journalists because um, it's in their interest to care about this stuff so you know it, I wonder whether whether you think that you know what's the what's the role of the public the audience the readership in this Are there, it, it's not because I didn't, it's not sure that they're being completely brainwashed by a completion of missing media they, they, they are there is information readily available if you want to read it that enables you to make your own mind up about big issues like corruption and austerity yeah i mean i think i'll just say that you know let's not let's not assume rational self-interest um you know because i think that ship has you know sailed a long time that's not a tenable model for understanding the, the things people vote for um the things people believe the kinds of things people pass on it isn't a question of like oh this part, political party in which i have invested my entire adult adult life in in votes turns out to be corrupt Hmm. Next election, I will decide to vote for somebody else. We know that that's not the way things work. I was recently asked this summer by I was cycling in Germany and some guy randomly in the middle of the Bavarian countryside asked me what's going on in Britain? Why do you guys keep voting for such strange um, outcomes? And I think he wasn't quite prepared for the sort of lecture I gave him on the functioning of ideology. Um, but, you know, cut a long story short, obviously, we're all kind of um, I think it would be a bit um, disingenuous for most people to say that they are completely free of um, forms of behavior that are not uh, that are not rational and actually yeah. um, you know like for instance I will never vote I will never vote Tory it doesn't matter what they say I just never ever will <laughs> I'm prepared to accept that and you know I've, I've had various friends challenge me about that but um, you know some would say that's that's foolish but that's that's my position um, and so I think that there are kinds of, this is, I mean, there's a whole chapter, in fact, really in a way, all of the chapters of my book are about different versions of this problem, but there are kind of obstacles to us just simply taking information and acting on it in a rational way. And um, the question is, you know, and this is an ongoing question, it's not one to which I claim to have all the answers. Why do we keep carrying on voting for strange, and violent and troubling outcomes? Why do we carry on doing things that we know are destroying our planet? Why do we carry on kind of using technologies like Instagram or whatever, which we know are, are bad for us? Um, you know, I think that these things go outside of the kind of um, informational problem of fake news and lying and so forth that we're talking about. But in a sense, whatever the issue is, the way that we learn about it, um, is affected by these kinds of uh, informational problems. So, I mean, it's no surprise to me that people, that people, you know, that now if the media suddenly turned around and just was always giving us exactly the information that we needed, I'm not saying it would make no difference, but it would take a long time before that um, really started to have the effect that I think we're we're saying it might. Okay, thank you. I mean. So Mar Marcus writes mostly in his book about what he calls the, the Euro-Atlantic zombie democracies. Mm -hmm. 
you've worked in you know lots of countries you've written about lots of countries would you say that the role of the media in terms of whether it's trusted trustworthy uh whether what, what influence it has on people's thoughts would you are you recognize is it the same picture you would say pretty much everywhere or do you do you see kind of other other dynamics at work outside of the, the euro atlantic uh, um before getting there i mean like this what you asked to marcus and what marcus said uh, is one of the central problems because it is easy to think okay now there is good information so why don't people Actually, this is a very important question. Why don't people, you know, why all these people are rather going to Twitter or Instagram or Facebook to get their, you know, uh, news or so-called news or information, let's say. Um, and, you know, we have to give it to ourselves at some point because we are going through a enormous transition in terms of uh, and you said attention somewhere, uh, Julian, uh, in our uh, behavior of attention. And our generation is, uh, you know, I remember the times when there was no mobile phones. And now I was introduced to mobile phones and then uh, smartphones and then social media. And then now, you know, uh, AI, you know, deep fake and so on and so forth. This is too much to take in. Um, for individuals. Also, we are going through a, a transition in terms of definition of citizenship, because in the beginning of 20th century, let's say the citizen was a responsible, responsible being who also had rights to contribute to the society, to understand the, the, you know, the enlightenment, enlightenment was still fresh in, every, you know, in people's heads and so on. And uh, we are, on the other hand, operating all of us are operating in an unregulated communication sphere. And I resemb it, it, to me, it resembles uh, the to, a little bit to the times when radio became the mass communication tool device. I, you know, it brought fascism, you know, ultranationalism and so on. And now this new communication tool, which is used by obviously uh, by the powerful, uh, you know, people in the society, is creating its own politics, its own uh, behaviors, its own um, attention behaviors, and so on. So it is not easy to put on the responsibility on the on the citizens, on the people. I think uh, we have to understand this transition and the gravity of it uh, if we are going to work with, with this. Uh, within this uh, period, uh, and if you're going to think about politics. Role of the media is uh, quite the same. And when you asked that question, it reminded me of a funny story that happened to me in New York Times. Uh, it was 2018, I think. Uh, the book, How to Lose a Country, was not published yet. And I was in New York Times talking to two editors. And I was telling them, yeah, okay, this is going to happen. It was a time when they didn't, uh, it was even before 2018, it was 17, I think. And uh, it was a time when American intelligentsia and New York Times in particular, uh, did not think that Trump would last more than a year. Uh, so I told them, you know, this is a global pattern. It's going to come to the, it here as well. And you are doing the same mistakes as media, American media. Uh, we did in Turkey as Turkish media. Uh, don't do this. This is not going to work because at the time they were giving platform to Trump supporters in New York Times to tell their stories. There was this, um, you know, um, glittering world dialogue, uh, conversation, and so on. And I and I was telling them like. This will not work, and this is not journalism. This is not information. This is not how you do it. And probably I, felt, I, I sounded quite crazy at the time to them. And now they are talking about a coup, uh, which, if you ask me, is you know practically happening, uh, or there's an attempt to it. Uh, so it is the same because actually this is also about what Marcus told earlier. 
uh, media, journalism, lost its moral authority, moral high ground somewhere around 1980s, just because uh, what Marcus talked about, because they didn't stand against uh, neoliberal process, this market-driven society transformation. Uh, they were, they became part of it rather. Uh, so I think we, we lost our moral high ground somewhere there because journalism or journalists were considered to be these you know, vagabonds, they are like stoic figures uh, that uh, who are doing anything to tell the truth, uh, to tell the story, the real story. They were the ones who were, they were the Davids against the Goliaths. And then all of a sudden they were the, you know, Minion Goliaths, let's say. So I think we lost our moral ground and this goes for uh, mainstream journalism globally. So now when you say Trump is not good for us, they would say, oh, okay, you, you know, um, so you, they, they became part of the swamp. Okay. Of course, I have to tell that there are amazing journalists and especially in my country, journalism is now a pretty dangerous job. And in, especially in mainstream media, there are no, almost none uh, real journalists at this point. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it happens exactly the same way. And mm -hmm. the reactions, uh, somehow we don't accept as journalists mm. that we lost the moral authority, we lost yeah. the moral high ground, and we exercise our old habits thinking that we are going to be untouchable in this uh, new uh, regime that is coming mm -hmm. towards us. And we don't understand that we have to get organized and actually protect journalism uh, from this new political um, disease. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to put a, to you a question from James Tansy, an audience member. Um, he says, it's striking to me that while the public conversation is focused on the manipulation of discourse by social media, Writers like Noam Chomsky have been talking about the manipulation of discourse by traditional media for decades. Um, so what role do you think that traditional media outlets have played in trying to focus the conversations on, on issues with technology? Marcus, this is kind of your, definitely your ballpark, isn't it? I wouldn't say that I think of it as being quite so orchestrated as that. And I wouldn't say um, that, you know, uh, that Chomsky would necessarily argue that either. Um, I think, at least that's not my understanding of, of his work. Um, I think that this is a lot more about, rather than focus, a lack of focus. Um, it's about a sort of complacency that's about not feeling you need to look at where the, the, the kind of origins are of these problems, perhaps because they, um, they don't affect you or they don't really seem like real problems or um, they're perhaps not even noticeable. I mean, when I first got into teaching journalism, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say this has changed a bit now, but when I first got into journal teaching journalism about sort of 10, 12 years ago, it was common to have to work uh, unpaid for a year in order to even get a, a good job at a newspaper. And that, that requires a certain degree of, of sort of bourgeois grounding, which, you know, uh, makes it impossible for people who perhaps are aware of, you know, structural inequality or, or inequality, you know, various other things. Um, to, to even get a foot in the industry. And so if you have, there's also um, been uh, numerous reports, um, one of which published by the Reuters uh, study for journal, Institute for the Study of Journalism by one of my former colleagues, Neil Thurman, on um, the lack of diversity in the newsroom, um, at least in British newsrooms, they're overwhelmingly white. So I, I, a lot of this is not necessarily about like some orchestrated way of, of steering the conversation towards these kinds of non answers like, you know, oh, it's technology or whatever, but rather a failure to to focus properly on what the actual structural origins are or what even what the problems are, never mind trying to trace their origins. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain outlets, I won't name names, um, where I feel like there is a real tendency to, to constantly push back towards um, looking at technology um, as a kind of the source of, you know, um, 
some of these kind of extreme politics that we've talked about oh it's whatsapp this week it's instagram last week it's always something and and you know there were so many valid critiques to be leveled at social media corporations it almost seems a shame to waste the opportunity um by by leveling at them um these sort of half-baked uh, yeah. cr criticisms holding them responsible for things that they are cynically exploiting rather than causing which is uh, i think a different um, a different thing. Yeah. So, I mean, what what role has the mainstream media played? I just think that they're complacent about looking carefully at where the problems are really being. Mm. So, um, there's another question which leads on from that. As was, whilst we're still talking about journalism, from Gal Bergman, and they 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 both submitted this question in advance and have just asked it in the chat. So I feel like they're definitely all very good. Um, from each of you, what's I mean? Again, just maybe one or two points here what would be your practical advice for journalists regarding causes that led them to lose their moral high ground? What's the one or two things that you think journalists could do that, that would really make a difference? Be patient and ex don't expect things to change um, in the next year. Um, secondly, if you have politics, just be honest about the fact that you have politics rather than trying to pretend that you don't, which is uh, both dishonest and futile yeah. in my view. Um, and um, keep keep chasing the the things that you really think are wrong with society, and try to help as many people as possible understand uh, why those things are wrong and how they came to, came about. And that most of the good journalism I see happening, um, I have an instinct to kind of to trust it because I get the sense that that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Aja, what about you? Yeah, uh, absolutely, Marcus. I agree with Marcus. Uh, Politics is considered to be dirty, especially since 1980s, because politics uh, was uh, something about the left, because the centrists, as Marcus told earlier, uh, was as if above and beyond politics. They were above and beyond ideology, as if they were represented like that. So do not get into politics that commandment for the journalism, journalism meant in practical uh, life in, in real life meant don't be a leftist. Um, so, uh, and you know, there was this uh, structural changes, uh, you know, in journalism. It happened in European countries, in United States, in European countries, and especially in Turkey. I watched it happening. Um, you know, the newspapers were bought by. Uh, the big man, big capital. So big capital had other businesses as well. Uh, and, you know, simultaneously, the newspapers cut their ties uh, with um, unions, with political parties and so on. There is no contradiction or conflict between being objective and being political and showing your political stance. This is something that people have to understand. And what we have to do practically is we have to uh, build independent uh, news networks uh, that are depending on journalism. Uh, and one of the things we lost uh, alongside moral authority uh, is our um, prestige, I think. Yeah. Because it, is, it was so interesting to me, especially uh, today, it's interesting to tell this because this is a, today is the, marks the 10th year of Arab Spring. Um, you know, when Tahrir was happening, I was there. And it was so interesting to see that people on social media were following some guy standing on Tahrir with a nickname rather than let's say New York Times or CNN. So all those logos that, you know, that have millions of dollars investment behind became not trustworthy, not as trustworthy as the real person on the ground. So actually to your earlier question, Julian, people are trying to learn the truth. They are trying to get the information, but they are now doing it in a different way uh, through a different behavior. Uh, but the main you know, idea, main you know, ideal, is the same right. they are trying to get to the truth so we have to you know reconstruct the entire media according to this understanding according to this perspective 
um, I think. Thanks. Um, there's one question I have to get in because we, we, we prompt, this is a question that we prompt, we advertised that we would ask. Um, it's nothing you cover in your book, Mark, it's QAnon, um, which for those who, anybody who doesn't know, is, is, is a lurid set of conspiracy theories that claim, among other things, that Donald Trump is the leader of the fight back against a powerful secret network of child traffickers. Um, I mean, do you, th I mean, you know, so that's a kind of really extraordinary version of the uh, of the conspiracy theories that you write about. I mean, where do you, you know, I guess, you know, this is all going to take a bit of a breather with Trump leaving the stage, but I mean, where do you see this stuff? Can you see this? Where do you think this stuff is going to go next? I actually think it's going to um, probably get worse rather than, rather than, uh, you know, go sort of float away. I mean, I try not to make predictions, um, but I sort of, you know, I, QAnon, a bit like Trumpism more generally, takes Trump as a as a vehicle for something that's been building a long time. And I think QAnon has a lot more to do with the politics that Joe Biden represents than it really has to do with Trump directly. And obviously he's myth mythologically he's made center, you know, central to QAnon, but in a way, their kind of gripes, if you listen, if you can bear to listen to them, are actually more to do with the kind of um, bizarre things that they believe about um, you know, about in the American sense, well, in whatever sense, these kinds of centrists, these moderates, these kind of, you know, the Epsteins and the, the Clintons. And so, you know, that that um, view of the world is really what is, you know, um, at the center of, of the QAnon conspiracy theory. And, you know, conspiracy theories, I guess the thing that I wanted to say about them in general was that rather than dismissing them as some sort of, you know, crank kind of, uh, you know, extreme, extreme thing over here that just sort of comes out of nowhere they are they they originate in the structures of power right we we believe in conspiracy theories because on some level we know or we perhaps we don't but um many people do because they know that power is conspiratorial you know and it, it always has been and um, neoliberalism certainly didn't didn't change that in fact it made it worse because it unified the government with you know, private capital in ways that were even more conspiratorial than before. And, you know, you don't have to be a political scientist to have some in intuitive sense that that is happening. Um, and so, you know, I mean, the problem is, of course, that the kinds of, you know, so we have suspicion and suspicion is quite justified, I think. Um, but then that goes in completely the wrong direction. I mean, I was amusing myself. I think I put, maybe they put this in the book, maybe I edited it out, I can't remember, but the number of um, conspiracy theorists, flat earthers who smoke tobacco, not realizing <laughs> that, you know, um, actually the tobacco industry is one of the kind of greatest, you know, conspiracies perpetrated on, on humans in the 20th century. Um, and so they're kind of pointing at the flat earth and saying how this is a conspiracy and they're smoking the real conspiracy. And so I think, you know, there's a sort of model of, of suspicion and, and, and that suspicion comes from a good place, but we're not really endowed with the right tools to be able to determine, you know, um, what to be suspicious of, or a lot of people are not. And that's something that, you know, is sort of deliberately or otherwise, um, so sort of structurally um, withheld from a lot of people. And I think also it's something that's, it's kind of built into the, the structures. I mean, Mark Fisher made the point that, you know, if you take the world as it is and you kind of take the individual people out of the government or whatever and you replace them with a whole other set of managers and all the rest of it do we suddenly imagine that the system is going to work in a kind of entirely honest way no that structure itself is conspiratorial in its uh, in its shape so as far as QAnon I mean I one thing I know we know for certain is that it, it's not going to be suddenly that these you know at this point millions of Americans are going to say ah oh, shucks our guy is not in the White House anymore. I guess we'll just go home now. No, this will only intensify, I suspect, their feeling of having been, um, you know, uh, wronged and lied to. And the other thing to say is, I mean, so Michael Barkun makes the point that conspiracies can be kind of, it can entail other conspiracies. So you get what's called a super conspiracy where people believe simultaneously in the sort of the great replacement um, in the sort of, you know, Pizzagate stuff around, you know, pedophilia that they believe in kind of, you know, the, in the Illuminati and the aliens and the flat earth. And of course, Trump being the kind of great liberator from all of these things all at once. 
And so, you know, much as they might be disturbing, quite often these stories are sort of a testament to the kinds of crazy imaginative uh, things that, that, you know, angry and suspicious human beings can and will come up with. And the one thing they do always is they change. They can continually evolve. They meet new circumstances. They, they take account of new circumstances. They build new features to take account of. I mean, QAnon is that in its core, because, of course, Q, whoever Q is, and we suspect Q is probably several people, um, makes predictions in these very cryptic ways that are open to, you know, enormous, uh, well, lots of different interpretations. But frequently, even if, you know, whatever interpretation you pick of these, of these uh, predictions, they don't come to pass. So then what does the conspiracy, did the conspiracy theorists do? Did they say, oh, well, Q was wrong. I guess maybe he's just an imposter and this didn't really, this wasn't, doesn't amount to anything. No, they just like, well, it was because he was stopped by the liberal establishment or whatever, you know, they always find another way. And I think this kind of um, bizarre US election that we've seen in which, you know, obviously we have a, I mean, I'm, I'm not given to like a great deal of like wholehearted belief in systems, but I think we can say that the American system, uh, flawed as it is, clearly picked a, a winner in this election. And still, of course, we have, you know, uh, millions of people believing otherwise. Um, and, you know, this is in a country where one third of people think COVID is also um, a hoax. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's it's going to continue and um it's probably going to take on more of a kind of uh you know a story about this election and what happened and the election having been stolen from them that narrative certainly is not going to go anywhere anytime soon thank you very much marcus um i think our time is up i'm afraid um so thank you very much to marcus gilroy ware whose new book after the fact is well worth reading Thank you. Being held up by <laughs> Aja Demel Quran. Thank you very much, Aja, for, for joining us. Um, the um, if you would like to find these, we will carry on again with more live discussions every Thursday in the new year. You can find out about them at the link that I've uh, put in the chat. Um, if you can't wait, uh, you can always look at that link as you'll see all of our previous discussions uh, recorded and accessible there. Um, if you want more open democracy, uh, you can sign up to our weekly newsletter at the link that is also put into the chat. Uh, I think Marcus has got his hand up. Well, I just oh, want to say uh, thank you very much to Echa Timelikaran for, for joining us. I really yes. appreciate it. I wish I could hold up your book, but I have it as an e-book, so I can't do that. But um, thank you very much. And thank okay. you to Open Democracy also. You're welcome. Thank you, Julian. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. Thank it was you both. And thank you, everybody who's watching. Um, I hope you have a really nice break, whatever you're doing with it and whoever you're spending it with. Um, and we'll see you all in the new year. Thank you. Bye-bye.